Things go from bad to worse for the Blackhawks as they lose to the Canucks and lose defenseman Seth Jones. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Blackhawks fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Blackhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Real quick, just a reminder to please go and hit that like button, comment down below, and most importantly, subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube. It's 100% free, will not cost you anything, not even a single penny, and really does help me out tremendously as I'm so close to reaching my goal of 2,000 subscribers. And last but certainly not least, I got to let you all know as well that today's episode is sponsored by Indeed. Are you still searching for a great candidate for your company? Don't search, but match with Indeed. If you need a hire, then you need Indeed. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all again, as always, for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. Hope everyone out there had themselves a wonderful weekend. Unfortunately, though, as... The thumbnail of today's episode reads, things went from bad to worse for our Chicago Blackhawks over the weekend as they wrapped up their mini two-game West Coast road trip on Saturday night. Their third serious road trip of the season already with another 9 p.m. Central Time puck drop. Fortunately, Blackhawks fans, this will be the final, or that was the final 9 p.m. Central Time puck drop the Blackhawks will have on their schedule until February 27th against the Vegas Golden Knights. So I guess one uh, silver lining of all these early road trips is you kind of get them out of the way here early on in the season. But another 9 p.m. Central Time puck drop for the Blackhawks on Saturday in Vancouver. Given it was 9 p.m. Saturday night, a lot of other things going on. I don't anticipate, plus the current state of this Blackhawks team and everything that's been going on recently, I don't anticipate... There were too many people highly invested or watching this game from start to finish. And for good reason, because the Blackhawks offense continues to be stymied. It was a hard-fought performance, in particular, out of Arvid Soderblom and Ned, who continues to just make notable leaps and bounds here uh, so far this season. Unfortunately, though, the Blackhawks were not able to get back into the W column. And unfortunately for the Blackhawks, even prior to to this 9 p.m. Central Time puck drop. Things had already taken a bit of a sour turn for them over the weekend as just a few hours prior to this game getting underway, the Blackhawks announced that defenseman Seth Jones has been placed on injured reserve stemming from a block shot he took to the right foot in the third period of last Thursday's game out in Seattle. The first indicator that something might not be right here was when the Hawks hit the ice on Saturday morning for their morning skate, and Seth Jones was not in attendance. Everybody was probably like, oh no, what's going on here? And then just a couple of hours later, bang, Richardson confirms to the Blackhawks media that he has been placed on injured reserve and will be out for at least a week here. And I know there are a lot of debates, and Seth Jones is probably the most polarizing member of the Chicago Blackhawks because of the contract that he signed and how much longer he's going to be signed at that price tag under the Blackhawks organization. Say what you will about his contract, though, but there is no arguing the amount of value that Seth Jones provides when he's in the Blackhawks lineup. Because all you have to do is go and take a look at how poor the Blackhawks have been since he was acquired from the Columbus Blue Jackets without him. The Blackhawks have been absolutely disastrous without Seth Jones in their lineup. Over the last three seasons, including Saturday's 4-1 to loss to the Vancouver Canucks, the Blackhawks are now 5-18-3 in 26 games without Seth Jones over the last three years. 5-18-3. They've lost 21 of those 26 games and have been outscored 101-48 to in the process. So feel what you will about Seth Jones' contract. Even I will say, as someone who has defended and supported Seth Jones when many Blackhawks fans have been consistently spewing vitriol in his direction, uh, he's a good player. He's a valuable player, but he is not worth what he's been get what he has been getting paid these last couple of seasons and what he'll continue to to get paid here by the Blackhawks throughout the term of his contract. But with that being said, Seth Jones's impact provides immense value 
to this team, and the numbers don't lie. Last year, without Seth Jones, he missed uh, 15 games. Last year, the Blackhawks went 3-11-1 and and were outscored 61-31 to without him. And then the season prior, in which he missed 10 games due to a broken thumb, I want to say it was. The Blackhawks were 2-6-2 and in those 10 games, so they lost 8 of the 10 there. They lost 12 of the 15 without Seth Jones last year. 0-1 without him so far this season. So again, I know his contract isn't ideal. Yeah, it's probably one of the worst in the entire NHL. I don't think it's the actual worst. I think Darnell Nurse probably has the worst contract in the NHL. But regardless of how you feel about him, I think Seth Jones, just looking at these numbers, and until Ben Pope of the Chicago Sun-Times posted them over the weekend, I knew the Blackhawks were bad without Jones, but I never knew it was like this jaw-dropping bad. So again... Uh, Say what you will about the contract, but Jones's value to this team, I think, is far greater than even what I, someone, a Seth Jones truther, uh, kind of realizes. And in addition to what the Blackhawks record has been without Jones these last couple of years, of course, he's leading the NHL in ice time through his opening 16 contests, contests this year, averaging 25 minutes and 43 seconds of time on ice. I mean, even when the Blackhawks have gotten kind of a right-hand man, a joker to Seth Jones's Robin, if you will, on the back end in Alex Vlasic. Seth still is nearly having to play half of the game on a nightly basis for the Blackhawks. And that's just because of his versatility and how he kind of is like a chameleon back there. Maybe he doesn't excel at one thing, but he's very well-rounded and can handle himself in any situation. Penalty kill, power play, five on five. He's going to be a minute muncher for the Blackhawks. Again, there are some flaws and some deficiencies, and he's not a perfect defenseman. He isn't worth the $9.5 million price tag per year, but he's undoubtedly the top defenseman and the most uh, well-rounded skill set that the Blackhawks have on their back end. So hopefully it's not going to be much longer than a week-long IR stint for Seth Jones because a Blackhawks team that's already been disastrous since he's joined on, not his fault, just the situation of this Blackhawks team and their rebuild They've been even worse, believe it or not, without Seth Jones on the back end. I also wanted to point out, not only were the Blackhawks without Seth Jones on Saturday in Vancouver, but they were also without forward Taylor Hall as uh, Luke Richardson. We've seen him go through a series of healthy scratchings here through the opening 17 games of the season. We've seen it with Lucas Reichel, of course, to kick off the season. Ryan Donato was randomly getting scratched early on, and we've also seen it with uh, Philip Kurashev and Tavo Teravainen this year as well. Now it seems like it was Taylor Hall's turn over the weekend to get the healthy scratching treatment. And I did mention in my preview episode that I dropped on Saturday morning, uh, I had a feeling that someone was going to come out to get Ilya Mikhaev back in the lineup against his former team, which wound up paying dividends as he scored the lone goal of the night for the Blackhawks. I actually expected that it was going to be Tavo Teravainen coming out of the lineup because quite honestly... He's not coming off of a torn ACL. He has higher expectations coming into this year. He would have been the one to me that would have been kind of getting a little bit of a message from the coaching staff. But at the same point in time, Taylor Hall certainly hasn't been consistent either. I've just talked here on the show about how I'm giving him a little bit of slack given his injury situation. But regardless, Blackhawks certainly need more out of Taylor Hall. They need more of his speed through the neutral zone to get things established in the offensive zone. They need more out of his offensive skill set, more out of him on the man advantage. But with that being said, Blackhawks fans, when Tavo Teravainen, Philip Kurashev, and now Taylor Hall, three of the most crucial forwards in this forward group, have now needed a healthy scratching to get a little bit of a wake-up call, and no one really on this Blackhawks offense is rolling on all cylinders right now. I think there's kind of a bigger theme going on than uh, just a Taylor Hall underwhelming or a Philip Kurashev underwhelming. It seems like there's kind of a greater problem going on with this Blackhawks offense as a whole. Yes, I've said time and time again, these players need to be better, but I think a lot of signs are starting to point towards Luke Richardson and his Blackhawks coaching staff. But it doesn't seem like things are going to be any easier as uh, it's been a quiet offensive stretch here from the Blackhawks, as I'll talk about more here in just a moment. And they're going to be without their main minute eater on the back end in Seth Jones. 
for at least the next week. Coming up in just a moment here, Blackhawks fans, I'll get into the game from Saturday night itself out in Vancouver and talk about what went wrong for this Blackhawks team as they've now dropped four of their last five games. But first, I got to talk to you all real quick about Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. And Prize Picks is now the easiest and most exciting way for you to play daily fantasy sports because all you have to do is simply pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Do you think Connor Bedard is finally going to snap his nine game goal drought when the Blackhawks? return home to the United Center on Tuesday, or how about Philip Kershev getting more than one and a half points? You and your friends can now cook up hot takes and win real money this season when you and your crew run your game with prize picks. And one thing that I really do enjoy about prize picks is that it's the only real daily fantasy platform that has an injury insurance policy so that your lineups stay in play even if one of your players were to get injured. So be sure to go and download the Prize Picks app today and use the code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps to get $50 instantly when you put $5 down. Again, that's code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps to get $50 when you play $5. Prize Picks, run your game. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network your team every day. Real quick, just wanted to say thank you all for making Lockdown Blackhawks your very first listen here to start off your week. Now for your second listen, make sure to go and check out the Lockdown Fantasy Hockey Podcast so that you can become a fantasy hockey expert and get the edge over your league mates with daily tips from Steel and Flip. And you can easily find the link to Lockdown Fantasy Hockey down in the description or simply search on YouTube and wherever You may be listening to your podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Segment two, getting into the game itself from Saturday, which, as I mentioned during segment one, resulted in a 4-1 to loss for the Blackhawks. Second in a row, go winless during their mini two-game West Coast road trip and have now dropped four of their last five games total. That puts them at 6-11-1 through their opening 18 games. Once again, good for dead last in the NHL standings. A far too familiar place for this Blackhawks squad these last couple of years. It actually was a close, contested, tight-knit game on the road for the Blackhawks, as most of their games have been this year. It's not like the Blackhawks are getting blown out. It's not like they look completely lost out there as a whole. You know, it's not like they're getting absolutely waxed in terms of the scoreboard. A lot of that is because of their good goaltending. But for the most part this season, the Blackhawks have found themselves in close games that go right down to the wire. They just can't do enough to win them. And that was a pretty similar story once again to what we saw on Saturday when diving into the what went wrong for the Blackhawks. It's almost like, stop me if you've heard this before, Blackhawks fans. Number one thing that went wrong, I thought, was the momentum completely shifted over in the Canucks' favor in the second period, a.k.a. Blackhawks were not able to put together a full 60-minute game, as has been the case for the entirety of the year. Vancouver led 17-7 in shots on goal in the second period after Blackhawks got off to a good start in the opening 20. They held a 1-0 lead, led, led in shots on goal, but then Vancouver started to get things turning in their direction. They tied up the game in the final few minutes, 1-1. Elias Pettersson on the power play. Tough break for Connor Murphy, who actually had two goals bank in off of him, including the game winner from Eric Brandstrom in the third period. Nothing really goaltender Arvid Soderbloom could do about either of those, but the Blackhawks weren't able to keep their foot on the gas like they did in the first period. Vancouver, a really strong and deep offensive team, as I dove into during my preview, uh, finally got it going and started to click and get on on the same page during that second period, and the Blackhawks were never able, really able to gain momentum back after that. Um, and then in the third period, even when the Blackhawks were down two to one after Eric Brandstrom scored what what eventually became the game winning goal, the Blackhawks were never really able to get sustained pressure, get long standing shifts into the offensive zone. In fact, they only wound up with three shots on goal. They had seven total in the third period, but only three of them came after Eric Brandstrom's goal that put Vancouver ahead two to one. So just 
after they gave up that goal, it, it was almost like they kind of understood that they weren't going to be able to to do enough to go and win this game. And it's like their hearts kind of got ripped out of them a little bit when Eric Brandstrom scored that goal. And then the offense just can't do anything. Just one goal games are seemingly all this team can produce at this point in time. And again, the the underlying or the prevailing uh, narrative, I, I think, is greater than any individual player who's going through it right now. Most importantly, Connor Bedard, of course, who has all the eyeballs on him, has all the fingers pointing in his direction. It's now nine games since Connor Bedard has scored his last goal. And of course, tough play for him. <clears throat> excuse me there to allow JT Miller to score the empty netter to uh, slash any hope out of the Blackhawks <coughs> chances, excuse me, still dealing with that cough Blackhawks fans, but Bedard whiffs on a dump and attempt leads to the empty netter for the Vancouver Canucks. He's going through it. Hall's going through it. Kurashev, Bertuzzi. I mean, everyone on this Blackhawks offense is struggling. So it's hard for me to just sit here and be like, Connor Bedard needs to be better. Yeah. Connor Bedard needs to be better. But so does everyone, and that's not just every player on this Blackhawks team. That's the coaches. I mean, the coaches really, if no line is working, no individual player is shining, no individual is having success, like something is clearly wrong here, and the lack of 60-minute effort, the lack of even consistency from period to period, night to night, the rotating forward lines, nothing has been consistent so far this year, and... I don't think it's a surprise that the Blackhawks are in this state of disarray as a result of that. Like, if you were to tell me all the line changes, everything that's juggling around, all these players who are ice cold, I'm not going to be surprised that the Blackhawks are dead last in the NHL because we knew the offense making strides in that department was going to be the biggest thing that made or made that makes or breaks this team going into this year. And obviously, all of the additions all of the hope that we had that was going to make this offense a little bit more dangerous, those have fallen flat on their face. So it's super frustrating to come on the show and just kind of say the same thing again and again and again. And I can't help but start to ask whether Luke Richardson, like, is he the right guy for this situation? And I know, I know, I know, I know. This Blackhawks team on paper, they're not a playoff contender. They're still in that bottom third of the league. But for them to be dead last in the NHL, look as lost as they have offensively in the lacking of scoring chances night in and night out. It, it is so concerning. It's so jaw dropping. And it's almost like, how do you fix it? How do you turn it around? Mm. It's a little mind melting right now. Before I go into segment three, though, I do want to be sure talk about a couple of good things from this Blackhawks game on Saturday. The first period was really solid and it feels like They still have had some lackluster first periods, but they're starting to get better in that category. And I just think the goal that they got from Nick Foligno, the drive and desire to get the puck to the dirty areas is something they really, really need to kind of learn from. And they just need to be firing pucks on cage when they're struggling to get this many high danger opportunities. They just need to be shooting the puck at all costs and just taking the puck to the net, making the simple play. And Nick Foligno driving the cage there for Ilya Mikhaev to jump on that rebound, I thought was a perfect example of that. So shout out to Mikhaev for striking in his return to Vancouver. Shout out to Felino for making the simple plays and driving to the net hard. Uh, hopefully that's kind of a memo that the Blackhawks can take and use to their advantage moving forward. The biggest, biggest, biggest shout out that comes from this game on the Blackhawks side of things, though, undoubtedly is for Arvid Soderblom, who just continues to be stellar in this backup role. A huge change from what we saw from him last year where he didn't even look like an NHL caliber goaltender. Now, believe it or not, Arvid Soderblom has the best save percentage in the NHL for all goaltenders who have played in five games. He stopped 29 of the 31 shots that he faced on Saturday. As I referenced, both of the Canucks goals banked in off of defenseman Connor Murphy, and then they went on to add two empty netters. Soderblom is unfortunately 1-3-1 and one now this year. He's lost four of his five starts. In all four of those losses, the Blackhawks have only mustered up one goal of support. He's got a 2.22 goals against average and a 934 save percentage. Huge cap tip to Arvid Soderblom for shutting up all the haters. And this is why you stay patient with young players, Blackhawks fans. Even last year, when Arvid Soderblom was going through the ringer, everyone was giving it to him. 
I tried to stay level on the show and say, listen, he's only 23, 24 years old. He's in a god-awful situation where he's in over his head and doesn't really have an NHL-caliber defense in front of him. I know everyone's shocked, and I'm pretty surprised, too, to see Arvid Soderblom playing at this level, but to see him figuring it out at the NHL level isn't the most mind-melting thing to me. So good to see him really turn it around, regardless of how long he's going to stay up here as everything is still up in the air with Laurent Persuas right now, regardless of how long he's here or whether he's going back down to Rockford. This is just such a huge stepping stone in his career in terms of proving to himself that he can get it done at the highest level and just also the mental confidence that it will ingrain in him moving forward at what other stage he's going to be at. Shout out to Arvid Soderblom for giving his team a chance on Saturday. Shout out to the Blackhawks goaltenders through the entirety of this year for giving their team a chance basically on a nightly basis. Dire times for this Blackhawks squad right now with this real struggling offense that has gone absolutely ice cold. There are my thoughts from a frustrating loss on Saturday in Vancouver. Coming up in just a moment, before I wrap up today's show, Blackhawks fans, I still have to get into our weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment. But first, I got to talk to you all about Indeed. We're all driven by the search for better in this world. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, but match with Indeed. And if you need to hire, then you need Indeed. Because Indeed is the best hiring and matching platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to an Indeed according to Indeed data. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree that Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. And one of the things that I really do enjoy about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so simple and so easy because you can skip out on the countless job sites that ask you unnecessary information and unnecessary questions and still doesn't wind up leading you anywhere. Instead, go and join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that currently use Indeed to hire great talent in an instant. And viewers and listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit when you visit Indeed.com slash LockedOn right now. Again, that's Indeed.com slash LockedOn. Need to hire? Then you need Indeed. Segment three, it's time for yet another Mailbag Monday here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast. And just as a reminder, go and drop your Blackhawks question down in the comment section below if you're watching this on YouTube right now. If you're tuning in through an audio platform and have a Blackhawks question that you want to ask, please make sure to reach out. Go and jump on over to YouTube and drop it in the comment section. You can also DM me on any one of my social media channels or even email LockdownBlackhawks at gmail.com. I love Mailbag Monday. I love interacting with all of you Blackhawks fans and listeners out there. But I won't be able to do this segment if you don't reach out with your questions. So please make sure to reach out on any one of my socials, email, or in the comment section on YouTube. First question I wanted to answer here today comes from F.R.D. Wendlier. Wendlier, I apologize if I completely butchered that name, uh, on YouTube who asked, any chance the Blackhawks trade one of their defenseman prospects for a forward? Bedard clearly needs some help here. And this is just going to be an interesting conversation, even if the Blackhawks offense wasn't struggling the way it is right now. This will be an interesting discussion moving forward, just given the sheer number of defenseman prospects the Blackhawks have. Alex Vlasic obviously has established himself as part of the mix, but along with he and Seth Jones, that's two of the six defenders. We know Seth Jones is going to be here long-term because of that contract. There's Kevin Korchinski, Artem Levshinov, Wyatt Kaiser, Nolan Allen, Ethan Del Mastro. can kind of throw Louis Crevier and Isaac Phillips into that mix. There's a lot of defensemen the Blackhawks have, and there's clearly not enough room for all of them here. Now, at the same point in time, not all of them are going to establish themselves as everyday NHLers, but it does feel like a, from afar that there is going to be a time where the Blackhawks are going to have to kind of choose an odd man out. And I do wonder, to me, the two, the, the three candidates for being odd men out would be Ethan Del Mastro, Nolan Allen, and Wyatt Kaiser. To me, those seem like they could be the odd men out. It's not going to be Vlasic. I don't think it's going to be Korchinski, and it's not going to be Artem Levshinov as the number two overall pick. 
The other three are going to be the real interesting ones. I personally think you don't really need both Nolan Allen and Ethan Del Mastro. They're kind of the same style of defenseman. Personally, I'm higher on Ethan Del Mastro, but obviously Kaiser, or excuse me, Allen was the one who won over the coaching staff here in training camp, had the better camp, and has since been a staple of the Blackhawks lineup for the most part here. I think it could be one of those two that ultimately wind up getting, getting traded. Now, with them being defensive-minded defensemen and not a ton of offensive game, I think Ethan Del Mastro has the better offensive game of the two. That's why, for me, he would probably be the one that I would choose. But with that offensive game, he also might be the one, and it's not an elite offensive game or anything. He just has better puck-moving skills than Nolan Allen, I believe. I think he could be the most, the more intriguing of the two as a trade ship prospect, which would absolutely break my heart. Ethan Del Mastro was the first Blackhawks prospect and first like pro hockey player, I guess you could say, that I ever got to interview. Uh, but it does feel like, yeah, one of those guys could be in the mix, potentially for a forward prospect in return as well. Definitely think that's something to keep an eye on these next few years. Next question comes from PHHDVM on YouTube, who asked, what players who are in the lineup right now will not be back next year? And how about after next season? So taking a look at Puckpedia, Taylor Hall, Andreas Athanasiu, Philip Kurashev as an RFA, Ryan Donato, Pat Maroon, Craig Smith, Alec Martinez, Wyatt Kaiser as an RFA, Arvid Soderblom as an RFA, and Louis Crevier as an RFA are all set to have expiring deals for the Blackhawks. Um, after next year, I could easily see Hall being gone, Athanasiu being gone. Uh, Donato, I think, is someone who kind of fits the bill, someone who could be a cheap re-sign for a couple of years, but it ultimately does come down to a numbers game as far as what Kyle Davidson projects. Maroon, Smith, and Martinez, I think, are all good as gone, as well as Hall and Athanasiu. Uh, Kershev is going to be an interesting one as an RFA. Same with Soderblom and Crevier and Kaiser, I think. Kaiser's going to come back. Soderblom, from what he's shown us now, is undoubtedly going to come back. But all those guys that I mentioned as UFAs, outside of Ryan Donato, I think he's kind of the one that's up in the air the most. I could really see all of them being gone. And then as far as the season after that, that's when uh, Brody comes off of the books, Murphy comes off of the books, Felino comes off of the books, Dickinson comes off of the books, as well as Mikhaev and Anderson, plus... Lucas Reichel and Connor Bedard as restricted free agents. And quite honestly, maybe Jason Dickinson comes back, but the rest are, are going to be pretty old. And, you know, Joey Anderson, Ilya Mikhaev aren't guys that really, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to make or break your team is basically what I'm trying to say here. So I could realistically see all of those guys being gone outside of Lucas Reichel and Connor Bedard. And there's even going to be an interesting conversation, uh, Based on Lucas Reichel, it depends on what he does over these next couple of years. But yeah, o over these next two years, a lot of a lot of these Blackhawks players that are on this roster right now are, are going to come and go. And that's kind of the point of Kyle Davidson signing them to these short-term deals. They're just kind of fillers here during these rebuilding years for the Blackhawks. Next question comes from Anthony Magnelko, who asks, Jack, what is the reason this team can't turn it around? 15 games in, and I already want to give up. Why can't we just get freaking better? Yeah, Anthony, I certainly feel your frustrations. The offense just cannot do anything. There's a lack of speed, a lack of creativity, and I just think a lack of a good game plan and a structure for these guys out there. And there's clearly a lack of uh, chemistry between one another as they've been jumbling lines all year long. Most of it stems from the offense because defensively, the Blackhawks have been about league average in that category, and their goaltending, I think, has definitely been above league average. It's just the offense that is absolutely letting them down, and just because it's happened pretty consistently through their first 17 games, and as I mentioned earlier, literally no one in this offensive group is exceeding expectations outside of Ryan Donato, I think that kind of points to the court coaching staff in my mind. Next question comes from Luke Heinzman, who asked, would you be willing to sacrifice from team culture at the end of the year to move guys to move guys at the trade deadline so you guarantee one last top five in a draft that's very thin in talent past the top five. Yeah, I mean, if the Blackhawks don't turn things around in these next 20 games or so, that is going to be the focal point. And I, it already kind of is the focal point still as a rebuilding team. They wanted to get better, but Kyle Davidson, as a realist, I'm sure knew this team wasn't going to be very good. Um... So I'm sure they've been keeping an eye on the 2025 draft as well. And as you mentioned, there's a pretty clear-cut top five. 
Um, so yeah, I absolutely do think they'd be willing to do that. And quite honestly, guys like Taylor Hall, Alec Martinez, Craig Smith, who's found the back of the net with some nice goals this year. I think they're all going to be moved at the deadline. Ultimately, Andreas Athens to see you as well. Right. I definitely would say that's part of the expectations. Next question comes from Tarun Kalra. I believe I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. 1091 on YouTube who asked, when does Kyle Davidson stop getting a pass? The NHL product is a joke. Our prospects are strong, but I don't see a top six guaranteed offensive forces as Demidov is as advertised. Of course, Levshinov is a nice prospect, nothing above the other seven to eight. D-man taken five to 15 picks later. When does Kyle Davidson stop getting a pass? Well, Luke Richardson definitely has to answer questions before Kyle Davidson does. Um, Kyle Davidson isn't getting a pass. There are a lot of people who are frustrated with his free agent signings and the lack of production we've gotten from Tavo Teravainen and Tyler Bertuzzi. I don't think Kyle Davidson is getting a pass. It's just I think there's an understanding that this is going to take a while. And I want to preach continuously that it is going to be a long process here. But as these years start to get more and more meaningful, which this year is the first of them, he is going to have to answer for lackluster teams if that continues to be a thing for the Chicago Blackhawks. I don't think you can really point too many fingers at Kyle Davidson and be pissed at him for this year. But the next season, that ramps up a little more. And the season after that, that ramps up a little bit more. I certainly understand the frustrations, especially with the Blackhawks struggling offense and them taking a defenseman with the second overall pick. That's why I wanted to take Ivan Demidov, especially because there were a lot of defensemen who, I said Levshinov deserves to be the first off the board, but it's not like he was leaps and bounds ahead the rest of them. Uh, But regardless, even if the Blackhawks took Ivan Demidov, this forward group would still be struggling right here, right now. So that that's kind of a moot point to me. We just got to be a little bit patient with Kyle Davidson, but I agree with each season, his job becomes more and more meaningful in terms of winning right here, right now. Last question I'm going to answer on the show today comes from Lionel the Goat, 3221, who asked, what are the odds the Blackhawks replace Richardson before the season's end? We can't do anything. Offense is awful. Bedard even looks bad. We need a new coach. I haven't loved how Luke Richardson's gone about things uh, this so far this season. I wasn't, you know, really thrilled with how he handled some of the young players last year. So I am not the biggest fan of Luke Richardson. But with that being said, I would not anticipate him being fired during the season. I, I think there is a very, very, very thin chance that winds up being the case again, just because of the realistic goals of the Chicago Blackhawks team. Are they underachieving them? Yes, they are, but it's not like they were supposed to be a team that's playoff bound and they're dead last in the NHL. No, we knew this team was still going to be bottom 10 in the NHL. I just thought it was going to be somewhere between 5 and 10 as opposed to 32nd in the NHL standings. Um, But what I will say is, if this continues and the Blackhawks don't show any progress, I don't think Luke Richardson gets that team option for the fourth year. And don't forget that. Four-year contract that Luke Richardson signed, he's in year three of it. But the fourth year is a team option, which is kind of a rarity for the NHL and their head coaches. But if this continues, I don't know how the Blackhawks, Kyle Davidson, in this front office would be able to bring him back for year four. Don't expect him to get fired during any point of the season. But if this keeps up, I don't think he's going to be the head coach of the Chicago Blackhawks for the 2025-2026 campaign. All right, that is going to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all again for joining me on the show. Be sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free right now, wherever you may be listening to your podcasts, and to go and subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube. That way, you can get the latest episode as soon as it becomes available each and every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can go and check me out on X at Jack Bushman, too, but be sure to follow Locked On Blackhawks. That way, or at Talk and Hockey, oh my God, Locked On Blackhawks. Go and follow at Talk and Hockey on X. That way, you can get all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until tomorrow's episode, everyone, I know it's been a crummy start to this year for the Blackhawks. I'm right there with you. Do your best. Have a great rest of the day. I'll see you next time on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.